it down for it. Right, excellent. Okay, um, thank you, Suzanne, for the introduction. Um, and thank you, everyone, for being here. It's really, really brilliant to be surrounded by so many people that are working with or working on Phoenix. Um, so this is me. Um, this is joint work I've done with Timo Becker and Eric Berman at UCL. And we talk about coupled fem-bem problems with Phoenix and BEM++, which Klaas touched upon in his talk. Um, right. So first of all, I'm going to be telling you why and how we're going to be doing fem-bem coupling, so what fem-bem coupling is. I'm going to talk a bit about some software, some implementation issues and how we got around them, and a Helmholtz example to demonstrate in more detail how we do this. And I'll talk at the end about a few other uses that this idea might have. Um, so first of all, why do we want to do fem-bem coupling? Um, so as you're probably used to, we're going to be solving some PDEs. Um, and we've got a region where we've got a localized inhomogeneity, but we've got a large or maybe infinite and a homogeneous medium outside. Um, and the inhomogeneity, that doesn't necessarily have to be the boundary of an object. It could just be an artificial boundary surrounding some pockets of different um, types of gas or anything like that. Um, for example, um, if we're solving Helmholtz equation, we've got an incoming wave and we've got a small area of variable density and a large, large area of constant density. So this is where we've got the inhomogeneity inside and the large homogeneous region outside. Um, so how are we going to go about fem them coupling? Um, so the idea is we want to use fem inside because fem is good at dealing with inhomogeneities um, because we discretize and we discretize over the domain. But because we discretize over the domain, this isn't good for the unbounded medium because we'd have to, to mesh an infinite region, which would be really impossible. Um, so we'd like to use BEM outside um, because BEM can deal with inhomogeneous homogeneous infinite domains um, because it discretizes over the boundaries. So the idea is we take the infinite medium and we discretize it over the boundary, which allows us to deal with this large domain. Um, BEM leads to dense matrices, although we can compress these, which I'll be talking about later, um, whereas FEM leads to sparse matrices, and that will be important later when I get to implementation. Um, okay, so the idea is that we're going to um, discretize the normal derivative on the boundary, so I'm going to use lambda for this, um, the value of the solution inside. Um, so we discretize both of these um, into phi and psi, and these don't necessarily have to be the same order type elements. Um, I should also say here that when we mesh this, we want the mesh on the boundary to be the triangles which match up to the tetrahedrons inside. Um, and classically, um, typically, these will be piecewise, um, piecewise linears and these will be piecewise constants on the boundary. Um, and it's usual to t do one order less on the boundary than you do internally. Um, and so, if we do fem on the inside, we get some sort of matrix equation involving u and lambda. And if we do BEM on the outside, we get some sort of matrix equation involving u and lambda. And the idea of coupling is that we bring these together. Um, we write the left-hand side as this big blocked system. Um, combine the right-hand side into one big vector, and now we've just got a larger matrix system to solve. So this is the idea, and I will come to how exactly we do this in a short while. Um, but first, software. Um, so some of you might have heard of Phoenix. Um, that is what we use on the internal domain. Um, on the ex in the exterior domain, we use BEM++. So this is some software we've been developing at UCL. You can find it at bempp.org. Um, it's a fast library for 3D BEM. We don't do 2D BEM, but we do 3D BEM for Maxwell, Helmholtz, and Laplace. Um, the new version, which should be coming out very soon, is going to have built-in H matrix support. Um, pre in previous versions, we used Ahmed, which, due to very restrictive licenses, has become more and more difficult to get your hands on and use. So we have now written our own H matrix code to replace that, which makes installation a lot more easier and a lot quicker. Um, Clicker isn't very good. There we are. Oh, um, okay. It's open source. Um, it's written in C++, hence the name BEM++, um, with a Python interface. And the nice thing about having this Python interface is that we have been able to do FEM-BEM coupling just using Python, because we've used the Python interface from BEM++, the Python interface from Phoenix, and we've had to do very little C++ um, to do this. And it's developed at UCL. And this is what we use on the exterior domain. Um, okay, before I carry on a little bit more about BEM++, because I'm half here to advertise our um, nice library. Um, so here are three sample uses of BEM++. So we have been working on um, doing time domain problems. So here we have, I think, modified Helmholtz um, in the time domain with a region which has a hole in the middle. 
Um, and this is, so this is not for Venmo Capital, this is just for BEM. So this is BEM++ on its own, this is the kind of things that BEM++ can do. Um, so that is one example uses. Another one we have, um, Sam Groth in Reading has been looking at light scattering from ice crystals. Um, so here he's got an incoming light wave and there's some scattering. And he's used BEM outside and BEM inside for this example. Um, and here is some high intensity focused ultrasound, which is Elvin's work, who's here. Um, so this is a rib cage, and if you have some high frequency waves coming in, this is the scattering you get, again, just using BEM. Um, and here's the development team. So Timo Becker is the lead. Timo is who I'll be forwarding all your difficult questions to because he knows a lot more about the library than I do. Um, Elwin, who I just mentioned, is here. Um, I'm there, and here are the other people that have developed BEM++. Um, who have been a really excellent team. It was really great. I started my PhD this year um, to start and already have this fantastic library that has made my work a lot easier for me. So thank you to all of these people. Um, okay, so a few practicalities in the implementation. Um, so my first FemBem coupling code um, was quite ugly. There were a lot of little details to deal with, and it took a long time to go through and write up. So to make it simpler, we've added some functions to BEM++ which will be included in the, latest, in the newest version which is coming out, to make this easier for you. So I think I've got two of these problems that um, I had to deal with. So first of all, when once you've got the mesh from the Phoenix mesh, um, we need to get the boundary mesh which we're going to do our BEM on. Um, and when we do this, we have real difficulties with the degrees of freedom because you have the ordering of the DOFs on the mesh, a different order on the boundary mesh, and then the Phoenix function space and the BEM++ function spaces both permute the DOFs. So originally, I was having to make three or four different permutation matrix multiplying together, and it was really, really awful. Um, but with some work, um, we have written this function here in BEM++. Um, so you give it the Phoenix space, um, which here, in my example, was the piecewise linear functions. And it returns for you the trace space and the trace matrix. So the trace space is a BEM++ function space. Um, which is the piecewise linears, which we need when we make the operator later, and the trace matrix, which you can multiply by, and it permutes straight from the Phoenix space DOFs to the BEM++ space DOFs. So with this one line, you can get rid of a lot of really awkward code. Um, yes, one more issue I had to deal with um, is, so I said at the beginning, the FEM matrices are sparse. Um, the BEM matrices are progressed using H matrices. So if you imagine building that big matrix I gave you, um, we could convert everything to dense matrices, but that would be really awful because we've got compression that we'd be losing. We could try and make everything sparse, but the BEM matrices aren't really made to be made to sparse matrices. We can't force the H matrices to be, the FEM matrices to be H matrices, so there's, actually building that matrix would be awful. Um, so we've written a blocked linear operator. Um, so the idea is that you separately give it the four matrices, it, solves, it stores them separately, and when you come to matrix multiplication, so if you're doing this multiplication, it would use... So it would multiply A by U first, for which it would use sparse multiplication, B by lambda, which it would use sparse multiplication, and then for C and D, because they're stored separately, it can now use the fast H matrix multiplication, um, which means solvers like GM res are very quick because we can use both different types of optimized multiplication together. I forgot what's on the next slide. Okay, so now I'm going to talk for the remainder of the talk, nearabouts. Um, about an example I've been working on with the Helmholtz equation. So I'd like to imagine there is a cube which gets dense towards the center, and there is an incoming sound wave, um, and we would use these equations to do it. So it's the normal Helmholtz equation outside the cube, where we're assuming the medium's homogeneous, and inside we introduce this nx, which accounts for the variable wave number as it gets denser towards the, cen the center. Um, so for the fem part, um, we have the usual discretization, uh, the usual weak form of the fem part. Um, and so you can see that these first two terms, because they involve u, are going to become part of a. This, because it involves du by dm, which is what we've called lambda when we discretize, is going to become part of b, and fm on that side is going to be zero. Um, so how do we implement these? So that is a, and this is done with Phoenix. So this is familiar to most people in the room. This is kind of the standard way you would write this up in Phoenix. Um, then for the second part, um, we use BEM++ for this, um, where we use the identity operator, which will do exactly this. Um, and there's another function we've added more recently, which is this matrix operator here. Um, the idea being that because we need to, so we're using the trace matrix here to permute 
So we build, this, we build this matrix from the identity operator. Then we need to permute the entries because of the different orderings. And um, actually doing the matrix multiplication is unnecessary. So we've built this matrix operator, which wraps this up as a Ben plus plus operator. And then when you do matrix vector, vector multiplication later, it will multiply by this, then multiply by this, which is quicker than actually doing the matrix, matrix multiplication at this point. <laughs> and finally, for FM, we just built some zeros. Um, that's trivial. Um, OK, now for the exterior domain, and I'm going to talk about this in more detail because I think people here are probably less familiar with BEM than they are with FEM. Um, so the outside of the cube, um, we're going to break our solution up into the instant wave and the scattered wave. And we're going to use this for the instant wave, where D is the direction um, and K is the wave number. Um, and if you look at integral equation methods and scattering theory by Colton and Kress, um, they show that you can write the instant wave and the scattered wave like this, where V is the single layer potential and K is the double layer potential. And both of these are integral operators involving the Green's function, the Helmholtz equation. Um, and if we add these together, we get this. Um, so those two give us U, those two give us U, and we get here. So this says that the scattered wave is double layer times U, take away single layer times lambda. This what we'll call lambda. And this, um, at the end of the solve, is very useful because this, um, these two operators only need these values on the boundary, hence why we can just cry over the boundary, but you can use this to work out the value of the scattered wave everywhere in the exterior domain. So once you've done the solve over the boundary, you can then use this to find the solution everywhere. Um, but first we need to actually do the solving. Um, so if you look at... Um, Steinbach in numerical approximation for elliptic boundary value problems um, showed that if we take this one and we integrate it over the boundary and then we get singular integrals, we have to take traces towards the boundary and there's lots and lots of long complicated maths that I don't want to talk about here. Um, we get this where now we've got boundary operators rather than the potential operators. Um, so we've got the entity operator, the double layer op operator and the single layer operator. And this is what we're going to use to write it's on the boundary using BEM. So, um, again, you can see there's U here and there's lambda here. So this part is going to be part of C, and this part is going to become D. Um, and we're going to have to do U ink on the other side. Um, okay, so for C, um, again, we do this in BEM++ because now we're actually doing BEM. Um, so from BEM++, we can just import the double layer and the identity operators. Um, you give them the function spaces you're working with. You give the double layer the wave number as well. And then we do, you can't quite read, the half times identity take away double layer potential. So just like it says half identity take away double layer potential, um, it's very easy to write this up. And then, again, we permute them to make sure that the matrices are the same shape. Um, similarly for that one, it's just the single layer operator. So we just import the single layer operator and do that. And then here we have to make the function we are doing um, we make it to a grid function and find the projection on the Ben++ space, and then we just combine them to make this vector on the inside. Um, so in those not very many lines of code, we have um, assembled the, the matrices and the vectors we need in order to do this FEM-BEM solve. And this is the solution we get. Um, where, so if the cube, the cube was here, you can kind of see how it um, gets denser towards the middle. Um, the incoming wave was coming like this. I think here I used 20 them elements on each side of that cube. Um, and this is, because it's all done in 3D, this is just a 2D slice at Z as a half through the solution. Um, and this, I think this took about a minute to do on my laptop, um, although I might be remembering 10 by 10 rather than 20 by 20. But it's a kind of order of minutes it takes to do this. Um, OK. Um, so I've got a little bit of time left. So I'm going to talk about a few other uses and other things we're working on with FEM-BEM coupling. Um, so the first thing I've been working on recently is um, now that we've got these nice, easy functions in BEM++, um, we can look at different formulations. So we've been looking at, um, Hitmer and Murray did this um, stabilized coupling to deal with resonances. Um, it's the same picture because I haven't got it working yet. Um, okay. But hopefully it's only a few lines of adapting code away from getting these different stabilized versions of coupling working. Um, another use, potential use for BEM++ and Phoenix and for BEM, FEMBEN coupling is light scattering from, from ice crystals. So again, this is Sam Goth's picture of just using it homogeneous inside. But if there was an impurity inside this crystal, um, the light scattering would expect to be very different from this. And 
currently, they, we can't deal with this if we're doing BEM inside, so we're going to be looking at using FEM inside the ice crystal and BEM outside to deal with impure ice crystals. Um, some of you may have seen Florian's post last night, and all of you will have heard classes talk now about how they're doing fem bem coupling for magnetic problems. Um, so that is another use of this. Um, I think I've got one final. And one final use is possibly medical imaging. Um, if you imagine you're trying to image an organ and you're assuming it's kind of homogenous outside that organ, um, we might find use for fem inside the organ and bem outside the organ. Um, although we're currently debating whether or not it's actually useful to do that here. Um, so in summary, um, it's useful, fem bem coupling is useful in a number of applications um, where we have in homogenous region and a large homogenous region. Um, it can be easily done from Python um, with Phoenix and BEM++. Currently only in the development branch, um, but very soon BEM++3 will be out, which will include it all, and we'll have all the examples I've written, and so it will be very easy to implement this. Uh, it's at bemplus.org. Um, and there, there's a few references if anyone wants to read more. And thank you for listening. Um, so we are taking the matrix out of Phoenix, and Ben Plus Plus then deals with complex numbers perfectly. Yeah. Um, so the H matrix library, which Timo has written, runs in parallel, and that is on the examples we've done. That is the most. Um, computationally important part of it. So that bit now runs in parallel, and we do have plans to make as much as possible run in parallel. Um, so I haven't done any of that work yet. Um, I think um, Timo is adding them as we need them. I think it's not that much work, but it's a significant amount of work, so we haven't added anything we haven't had an application for yet. Uh, but maybe Alwyn could answer more about that. Um, no, so when we've built the block system, um, we then use GMRES, or I'm using GMRES or other um, iterative solvers because we've got really fast matrix multiplication on the system. Um, and with, um, yes, currently my preconditioning, preconditioning is really bad. Um, I'm reading up on better preconditioners to make it faster. <laughs> yes. Um, so it's it's currently part of Ben Plus Plus. But we're planning to separate it, and then people could use it. In fact, it will work for other problems. Just we've currently only used it for Ben problems. Right, thank you very much. So we now have a um, lunch break, uh, which runs for well, we're on time, so it runs for an hour and a half. Um, and there will be lunch down in the room where we've had coffee, should be delivered down there now. Uh, before we head off to that, because this is easier to do now than when everybody comes back from lunch and struggles in late, I will uh, let you know how uh, getting to dinner works. So the vast majority of people here are going to dinner. There are, as those of you who bother to read your emails will know, three ways of getting to dinner. Um, leaving aside the simulator habit of taxis, which I don't recommend. Um, the first option is it takes about an hour and 20 minutes to walk from here to Goggins. And it's quite a nice walk because you go through the parks and down past the palace. And you can see um, uh, Parliament Square and Big Ben and go along the South Bank. So Miklos and Andrew are going to lead the walking party. And up, yep, so these two gentlemen. So I guess since we need to be at Goggins at 7, they're going to leave the level 2 foyer, the front foyer, at about 5.30. Don't walk too fast, because if you get there before me, I won't put my credit card behind the bar yet. Um, <laughs> second 
second option is that we have a CC bike scheme in London, which means you can put a card in and pay a couple of quid and get Lawrence and I will be leading the cycle party. So, right. so we will, I guess, meet at about um, six in the level two lobby to find people because obviously we're a lot faster than the pedestrian. I fancy either walking or cycling over there, then it's very easy to get there by tube. Go down to either Gloucester Road or South Kensington. Get on the green or the yellow lines going east and get off the black line. Alright? Not yet. Tube station. Tube Blackfriars. Um, it's also been an email, and you read your emails, so that's fine. Um, just so that we know roughly how many people are waiting for, how many people are thinking of walking. So there's going to be about 10 people who are going to be turning up to walk. How many people are thinking of cycling? So we have about half a dozen or so of those. Cool. Okay, excellent. So that's all I have to say now. Oh, and be nice to Patrick. Can't let anyone sign his card. Um, it's down in the room downstairs sitting on the tables. And yeah, lunch should be waiting downstairs.